whispers. And today I am reading you a story, a short story, from the Grey Ghost book from 1912. This story is called The Mystery of Berkeley Square, an investigation and it results. a haunted house in Berkeley Square. But by whom or what it is haunted, nobody seems to be able to give a definite account. Various vague rumours have hung around the house for years, and supposition has been rife as to the particular kind of haunting. I remember, years ago, hearing a weird story connected with the house in which the ghost of a child in a scotch played frock, played the chief part. The poor child was supposed to have been either tortured or frightened to death in the nursery there, and its pathetic little wraith, sobbing and wringing its hands, used to appear to the inmates until nobody dared to live in the house. I also heard another story, which I will relate further on. All my life, the haunted house in Berkeley Square has had a strong fascination for me. I have gazed up at its solemn face with awe and longed to fathom the mystery of its ghostly reputation. I have questioned one person after another, but though everyone knew there was a ghost in Berkeley Square, no one could give me the details I wanted. An old aunt of mine used to say it was coiners, and added that they carried on their nefarious practices in the empty house at night, and made weird sounds and showed ghostly lights in order to keep intruders away. The coiner theory never satisfied me, because it has been held by sceptics of so many other haunted houses, and is such a very tame and commonplace solution of a good ghost story. As a matter of fact, I had never heard anyone but my aunt propound it with regard to Berkeley Square. Since those days I have searched the files of old newspapers and magazines for some elucidation, and have investigated as far as possible the story of the mystery. The result is contained in the following pages, and if it interests my readers in the reading half as much as it has me in the finding, I shall feel well rewarded. In Notes and Queries for November 1872, the following appears in reply to a query. It is quite true that there is a house in Berkeley Square, number 50, said to be haunted and long unoccupied on that account. There are strange stories about it, into which this deponent cannot enter. Littleton. Naturally, this paragraph aroused a good deal of curiosity, and the following January, a correspondent signing himself E.M.B. wrote as follows. Lord Littleton speaks of the house, number 50. Berkeley Square, as said to be haunted and long unoccupied on that account. Some weeks ago, I took the trouble to ring the bell, the knocker being fastened down, which was answered by an old woman coming up the area steps, who, in response to my inquiries, stated that the house was occupied, but refused to say by whom. I have made further investigations in the neighbourhood, and find that strange noises have been heard in the adjoining houses, and at one of the shops in the square I was told of the case of a lady going out of her mind after sleeping a night there. Can Lord Littleton give any further reason for supposing the house to be haunted? Lord Littleton, however, evidently refused to be drawn and the next reference to it we find in Notes and Queries is under the date of August the 2nd, 1879. Here, the writer W.E. Howlett contributes the following interesting cutting from Mayfair of May the 10th, 1879, and asks, What is 
is the mystery connected with the house in Berkeley Square. The cutting runs as follows. The mystery of Berkeley Square still remains a mystery. We were in hopes, during the last fortnight, that a full, final and satisfactory answer would have been given to our question. But we have been disappointed. The story of the haunted house in the heart of Mayfair is so far acquiesced in by the silence of those who alone know the whole truth and whose interest it is that the whole truth should be known. The story can be recapitulated in a few words. The house in Berkeley Square contains at least one room of which the atmosphere is supernaturally fatal to body and mind. A girl saw, heard, or felt such horror in it that she went mad and never recovered sanity enough to tell how or why. A gentleman, a disbeliever in ghosts, dared to sleep in it and was found a corpse in the middle of the floor after frantically ringing for help in vain. Rumour suggests other cases of the same kind, all ending in death madness or both as the result of sleeping or trying to sleep in that room. The very party walls of the house when touched are found saturated with electric horror. It is unhabited, save by an elderly man and woman who act as caretakers, but even these have no access to the room. That is kept locked of a mysterious and seemingly nameless person who comes to the house once every six months, locks up the elderly couple in the basement and then unlocks the room and occupies himself in it for hours. Finally, and most wonderful of all, the house, though in Berkeley Square, is neither to be let nor to be sold. Its mere outside shows it to be given up to ghosts and decay. Readers who feel curious about the matter are referred to our issue of a fortnight ago, for the details of which the above account is a resume. The next reference is in Notes and Queries of November the 20th, 1880. Mr. T. Westwood writes from Brussels to ask for aid in collecting the facts and evidence about this sinister mansion, as he calls it. He recapitulates the alleged facts and suggests a legal inquiry, saying that the murders were doubtless the work of some party or parties unknown, and that the whole thing had now become nothing more or less than a criminal matter. The following week, a sceptic, signing himself J.C.M., wrote as follows. The mystery vanishes the moment we use ordinary means of arriving at truth. Instead of indulging our imaginations, I pledge myself to the accuracy of the following facts. The house in question belonged to an eccentric gentleman. He was in good circumstances, but chose to spend no money on it. For many years, soap, paint and whitewash were never used. He was occasionally visited by a sister, the only person seen to enter the house except his two maidservants. Then, by degrees, began the stories, insanity, murder, walls saturated with electric horror, etc. He died. The sister sent in an estate agent to see whether it would be worthwhile to put the house in order for the, the remainder of the lease. The agent, an intelligent and cultivated man, told me that he found the house in hideous disrepair. He asked the maids if they ever heard strange noises. They said, no. Do you ever see ghosts? They laughed. We never see none. The matter, however, was not allowed to rest here. New light was thrown upon it in the following month by a correspondent writing under the name of Clary. After some humorous comments to the effect that a man's house is his castle and therefore should be immune from rumours of haunting, Clary writes, a friend sent me a book saying, here is the full account of the ghost in your street. The book is called Twilight Stories, but I find 
assertion, which I have no right to contest, but so does Miss Rhoda Broughton in a contrary direction, heading it, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. JCM also brings into account as witnesses a nameless eccentric landlord, a nameless house agent, and two nameless maid servants. Can he hope we shall ever reach the truth by such anonymous modes of proceeding? I may ask, too, does he suppose that either his particular house agent or any other house agent under the sun would gratuitously damage the character of the house he was interested in letting? I am not credulously disposed, and as I have already said, I set aside the supernatural theory altogether, but I refuse to admit that such a superstructure of rumour and panic and terror could be built out of elements so slender as those suggested by J.C.M., to wit, the absence of a little soap, paint and whitewash, and therefore I look beyond him for the enlightenment. Signed, Brussels. The next link in the chain of evidence is an important one. Writing from Bath, in Notes and Queries, of December the 25th, 1880, Mr. J. F. Meehan says, The following particulars of this affair may perhaps be of interest. They are extracted from an original letter, lately in my possession, addressed to the late Bishop Thurlwall. It was written on January the 22nd, 1871. Ghosts remind me that I never told you a story, Mrs. A. Related to us when she was here last, about the haunted house in Berkeley Square. S. pointed it out to me last spring. One side of it looks towards the street, which, crossing Mount Street, runs into the square opposite Lansdowne House and the other side into the square itself. The dilapidated, forsaken, dusty look of the house quite suits a reputation for ghosts. By the way, I am not sure whether it is the corner house or next door to the corner house, but Lady M declares that the real site is at the end of Charles Street, where the street opens into Berkeley Square. This house, she says, is strictly watched by police, None of its inhabitants ever cross its doorstep, and false coining is supposed to be carried on there, but has never been detected. Miss H, who repeated this tale to Mrs F, was told by some R.C. friends of hers that a family they knew hired the haunted house, wherever it is, in Berkeley Square, for a London season as there were daughters to be brought out, one of whom was already engaged. They spent a short time in the house without finding anything amiss. Then they invited the young lady's lover to join them, and the next bedroom, which they had not occupied, was made ready for him, and the housemaid was either sleeping there, or else still busy with her preparations at twelve o'clock the night before his arrival. The hour had no sooner struck than piercing shrieks were heard, loud enough to rouse the whole household. They rushed upstairs, flung open the door of the haunted room, and found the unfortunate housemaid lying at the foot of the bed in strong convulsions. Her eyes were fixed with a state of expressive terror upon a remote corner of the chamber, and an agony of fear seemed to possess her. Yet the bystanders saw nothing. They took her to St. George's Hospital, where she died in the morning, refusing to the last to give any account of what she had seen. She could not speak of it, she said. It was far too horrible. The expected guest arrived that day. He was told the story and that it was arranged that he should not occupy the haunted room. He voted it all nonsense, and insisted upon sleeping there. He, however, agreed. 
agreed to sit up until past twelve and to ring if anything unusual happened. But he added, on no account come to me when I ring first, because I may be unnecessarily alarmed and seize the bell on the impulse of the moment. Wait until you hear a second ring. His betrothed expostulated in vain. He did not believe in apparitions, and he would solve the mystery. She listened in an agony of suspense when the time of trial drew near. At last the bell rang once, but faintly. Then there was an interval of a few dreadful minutes, and a tremendous peal sounded through the house. Everyone hurried breathless to the haunted room. They found the guest in exactly the same place where the dead housemaid had lain, convulsed as she was. His eyes fixed in horror upon the same spot, and like her, he never revealed his experiences. They were too awful, he said, even to mention. The family left the house at once. I shall be happy, concludes Mr. Meehan, to supply privately the names he had left blank. This is the version of the story which was current in London years ago as regards the haunted house in Berkeley Square. The present writer well remembers hearing it, as well as the other, about the child in the plaid frock, and shuddering over it in her own childhood. On page 51 of Glimpses in the Twilight by the Reverend F. O. Lee, D.D., published in 1885, the letter from Bishop Thirlwell is quoted from the pen of a late bishop of the established church in Wales. Following it are these two accounts, quite independent of that above, and of each other, having been supplied by persons who professed to be acquainted with the circumstances of the house in question. Number one. The Chronicle will tell you that the house is still under the influence of the magic spell thrown around it by its late occupant, who practised for years her magic tricks in the rooms on the first floor. This tenant was a lady of high family, who had lived in solitude and celibacy, spending her whole life in the pursuit of forbidden knowledge. She is described at great length in the memoirs of a French adept, who came over to England to assist in the work in which she was engaged, that of extracting from a deceased minister the secret motive which had actuated him in a certain parliamentary measure, by which the career of a member of her own family had been ruined. Milady, says the adept, was a very little woman, verging on old age, but full of life and vigour. Her eyes were black and sparkling with fire. When conversing rapidly, they seemed to throw out sparks from beneath her broad, black, bushy eyebrows, over which fell in disorder thick masses of hair, white as the driven snow. After a visit of some days with the lady, and many seances, to one of which Sir Edward Bulwer-Lytton was invited, the object was accomplished but imperfectly, and, says the adept, the bitter exclamation which fell from her lips on becoming convinced of her failing power touched me to the heart's core. Too old, too old, she cried, as the instrument she had been using in her vocation dropped from her hand and she sank against the wall. Number two. Of all the haunted houses that I have heard of, the corner house in Berkeley Square is the most terrible. It is stated that owing to previous experience of the house, the late proprietor was loath to let it, but he was persuaded by a gentleman who was about to be married to let him have the house. The house was furnished for the newly married couple who were to occupy it on their return from abroad. When they were expected back, the mother-in-law went to put the house in order for them. The first night she slept in the house, her maid heard a scream, and going into her mistress's bedroom, 
found her quite dead. In consequence of this calamity, the house was not occupied by the family. Soon after this, a man expressed his determination to sleep in the haunted house with his dog. On arriving at the house, the dog refused to enter and was carried in against his will. The man slept in the house with the dog in his room and he and the dog were found dead. The dog appeared as if it had been strangled. On another occasion, a gentleman occupied the room where these tragedies had occurred. His manservant sleeping on the landing outside the door. In the night, the gentleman was aroused by a noise outside the door and found his servant dead. Since these events have happened, the house has remained vacant. The above accounts are both interesting as giving another and totally different version of the alleged haunting of 50 Barclay Square. The eerie occupant who threw her magic spell over the house from her rooms on the first floor was evidently what we should call today a spiritualist and clairvoyant who gave seances which were attended by persons interested in spiritualism. Sir E. Bulwer-Lytton's ghost story in Blackwood has always been supposed to have been inspired by the Barclay Square mystery, but as it is too long to give here, I must refer my readers to Blackwood's magazine for August 1859 and can promise them a thrilling story for their pains. Sir E. Bulwer-Lytton, by the way, lived in a house of moderate size at the east end of Charles Street, Barclay Square. With regard to account number two, we have first a kind of variety on the Bishop Thirlwall story, and next two quite new stories, the one about the dog being distinctly Ben Travato. Dr. Lee's book was published in 1885. Clary contributes the following details to the issue of Notes and Queries, dated December 25th, 1880. The case, as related to me, was that Mr. Myers, being engaged to be married, took the house, number 50 Barclay Square, which was furnished, and that every preparation was made for, as he supposed, his future happiness. But just before the time appointed for the wedding, the lady jilted him. This disappointment is said to have broken his heart and turned his brain. He became morose and solitary and would never allow any woman to come near him. A male servant only was allowed occasionally to see him and he lived alone. Sometimes, but very rarely, could he be seen in the backyard. At night he would keep his assignation with his woe and flit about the house. At this time, doubtless, strange noises would be heard by the neighbours, and thus, upon the melancholy wanderings of this poor lunatic, was founded the story of the ghost. Those whom so many people persist in calling mad doctors could tell of hundreds of cases of minds, diseased and conduct similar to that of Paul Myers. His sister was, it is said, his only relative, and she was too old or too great an invalid to interfere. He was wealthy, and the letting value of a house in Barclay Square was nothing to his distracted mind. About two years ago, I saw his hatchman up at number 50, and I then hoped that the poor unhappy man's story together with his ghost, would have been interred with his bones. But fondness for, and a craving after the marvellous, have, I am sorry to say, revived the present discussion. The house having now been treated to soap, paint and whitewash, and all that can be gathered of the wretched and lonely eccentric, being told, let no one seek further to draw his frailties from their dread abode and let no one believe that there was ever the slightest foundation for the existence of a ghost. JCM and CCM also contribute the following details to the same number. The former writes, As there is a demand for further details about this,
this house, I sent the following, which I procured from Mr. Lofts, the estate agent in Mount Street, who is agent for Lord Fitzharding. Atkins, a Belstra in Argyle Street, has had charge of the house since it was bought by Mr. Myers, the eccentric gentleman of my previous letter, who bought it of Mr. Todd Enby on the death of Miss Curzon. I went over the house with him and with Lord Fitzharding's solicitors about a year ago. He told me Miss Myers, the heir, was in delicate health, almost bedridden, and lived in Tilney Street, and that as long as she lived, she would not deal in any way with the house, as she had an idea she might wish to inhabit it herself some day. She refused to renew the lease, which will expire in four years, and within the last twelve months, a reversionary lease has been sold by Lord Fitzharding to Mr. Fish, the well-known builder, as a speculation. We will now leave it there, and I will continue the rest of this short story, The Mystery of Barclay Square, in another video. This has been Kate at the Library of Whispers, saying, I shall see you very soon.